welcome to the Langley Centennial Museum. We are docents, volunteer educators, here today to talk to you about archaeology. My name is Karen. Hello, my name is Anne. Archaeology is the study of people and cultures from the past. Archaeologists do this by examining objects found that these people have left behind, called artifacts. Hi, my name is Amy. An artifact is an object made, used, or modified by someone in the past. Hi, I'm Maureen, and we are four of the nearly 50 docents at the museum. We would like to acknowledge that today we are fortunate to be living, working, and learning on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. Before archaeologists can start digging in British Columbia, they need to receive permits from the provincial government and from any First Nations communities that have laid claim to the land that the archaeologist wants to dig in. Throughout history, 18 different First Nations communities have lived in the Fort Langley area. That means that any artifacts found in Fort Langley were left behind by an ancestor of one of those communities. So it's very important that archaeologists work directly with the First Nations communities. Sometimes the archaeologists will be asked to take part in a smudging ceremony. The purpose of the smudging ceremony is to cleanse the soul of any negative thoughts or negative energies. This will allow artifacts to be found by someone who is pure of heart, who will treat the artifact with extreme kindness and respect. Archaeologists excavate in all different kinds of terrain. Sometimes in an open field, it could be a forest, or even in a rocky riverbed. And since they're digging outside, they need to be prepared to work in all different kinds of weather. From the hot sun, to the rain, and even in the snow. Safety is extremely important on archeological sites. Sometimes archeologists may need to wear a safety vest, a hard hat, or even steel-toed boots, all depending on where it is that they are digging. All archaeological sites in BC are protected by the Heritage Conservation Act. Here we have examples of artifacts that have been found by archaeologists in various digs around British Columbia. We're going to take a closer look at each of these articles one by one. Here we have an example of a shell midden. A shell midden was like a garbage pit. People would eat mussels or clams or oysters or maybe uh, meat from animals and throw their bones and remains into a pile. This would get covered up over time by layers of dirt and grass and archaeologists would excavate it and discover the diet of the people who lived in the area. These are examples of small animal or fish bones that could have been found in a shell midden you see skulls of small animals and a vertebrae. It also gives us a clue about the diet of the people who use the midden. These pieces of charcoal would indicate that there had been a fire pit used for cooking or for heating the longhouse where they were found. These are pieces of obsidian. Obsidian is very, very hard and was very, very valued. It comes from volcanoes and the presence of obsidian would tell us that there was a, a degree of trade between the First Nations around Fort Langley with people who lived closer to a volcano where obsidian was available. It was used for projectile points and um, for cutting. This is a hand maul. First Nations people used what was around them to make tools, and this would have been ground down to fit a hand and used as a hammer, perhaps to pound in a wedge in a cedar log to make planks for the longhouse. This piece of slate was ground down to make a cutting or scraping edge for scraping animal hides or maybe dicing herbs or berries. Not all artifacts could be removed without um, destroying them. This is an example of uh, a feature, a fire pit, 
and if the stones were removed, the feature would be destroyed. So they are photographed, examined carefully, and left in place or in situ. This is a projectile point. It's made of animal bone, and we call it a projectile point because we don't know whether it was used on an arrow, on a spear, or perhaps a harpoon. Hi, here we are in the museum's program room where we've set up a simulated dig um, to show you exactly how things are done at an archeological dig. I've even wore a vest for the occasion. It comes complete with multiple pockets so we can see how they wear, what clothing they wear. Of course, they don't wear the fancy sleeves, but anyhow, we've also got the tools for it, um, but we'll go through all those things for you so you'll know a little bit about how things are done at a dig. Now we're gonna take a closer look at what's used in a dig. The tools are not fancy at all. We have an ordinary little garden trowel. We have a broom, just your home variety, even a paintbrush, a dustbin, just an ordinary bucket, all ordinary household tools. We're gonna to go over the little bit of the techniques too that we are using in the field. If you would point your shovel straight down into the dirt, you would have a, a chance on harming your, or, or damaging any artifact you might find. So you do have to put your trowel perpendicular to the soil. So you would be moving your soil slowly back and forth like this and listening for any different kind of sound other than the regular soil. And any soil that you have, extra, you'll be moving into your dustbin like this. See, you're hearing different sounds. And moving into your bucket for later on screening. Now, why would you want to do some screening? They have a screen in the field like this, too, to collect any small bits, like beads or animal, small animal bones, or any, any other client, uh, small artifacts that you might find. Let's keep on digging. We see another small little rock here. We do hear something there. If you hear something a little bit louder like that, you would probably want to move your trowel away and start using your broom to see if there is anything bigger there. And we do see something there, a bit of a bigger thing there. And you do want to brush away all the dirt to expose anything that might be laying there. Expose all the edges. Now it's very, very tempting to go ahead and take that out, but you do have to leave it in place until all the measurements have been taken. Right, brush aside all the dirt from all the edges, all like that, and if you need to, you can take that paint brush and get in there and take all the fine, ed brush away all the fine edges away, brush any other little stones away, get all the fine dirt away, expose all the edges of the artifact, and that's when the important job comes, is taking the notes, because you have to know exactly where, where that um, artifact is found in, in relation to any other artifacts you have found in that, in that uh, dig site. Now, in order to take these measurements, we first have to establish where north is. All measurements are taken from the southwest corner of the grid that you've established beforehand. Of course, an, a grid is usually divided up into a meter by meter grid, which we've sort of established here in, their, in our box here. So all our measurements for today, for the purpose of this dig, will be taken from this corner. Um, so we will be measuring from here, from the south corner to the north, and from the west edge to the east. So let's just try and take a measurement here. So you would measure to the center of your artifact, you would measure from the south edge of your grid to the center of your artifact and of course we're in Canada so everything would be a metric and that would be 26 centimeters and from the east edge of your or west edge of your grid to the center of your artifact and that happens to be 28 centimeters. Those coordinates would be then carefully noted on your record sheet which would be then bagged with your artifact and sent to the lab at a later date. It's also important 
to record how deep that artifact is in your site dig. And that has to be measured from a predetermined point called a datum. And that's usually from the top edge of your dig site, but for the, our purposes, it's the top edge of our box. So we would have a string with a level on it, and that's strung across your dig site, or in our case, a box. And there, it's got a level on it, and of course with a level, you have to make sure the bubble is in the center here. And then you would take your measuring tape and measure from that string down to the center of your artifact and take that measurement and say that is the measurement of depth below datum. And now it's time for the big reveal, which of course is the most exciting part of it all. That's why we do these digs. You would gently take it out and if you need to, you could brush around it, but I think in this case it's okay. You would brush off any other exposed particles there. Gently, of course, you have to be careful with all these artifacts. And here, it looks like what we have here is a hand maul. It's broken, you can see the top edge here has been broken off. It is old, of course. You can see it would be held in your hand like this and used to pound things. And that would be sent to the lab along with all the important information that you've written on your sheet. It would be folded in there along with the bag and that would be all sent to the lab for further analysis. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time in the lab. We're going to look at different utensils and materials that are used to measure things and weigh things and categorize things. I think we'll start with this magnifying glass because often we like to look at details for our own curiosity and for interesting features that may be on each article. So, hmm. you can get closer or far away just to see exactly the things that you're most curious about. After we've looked at it under the microscope, we would probably want to measure it, just using an ordinary household measuring tape. You can easily measure, carefully measure, really, and then to make sure that we record accurately what our measurement is. Another way of measuring is using these calipers. With the calipers, we can not only measure the length of the item we're looking at, we can also measure the depth of it as well. So they're a very useful tool in the lab, but probably one you wouldn't see every day. Another commonly used item is a scale, of course. So we would want to know how each much each item weighs. Not much. <laughs> but let's try a heavier item. There we go. So this piece of uh, stone weighs 47 grams. And we would make sure that we recorded that accurately too. One important thing that I forgot to mention is that archaeologists wear gloves while they're in the lab. Wearing gloves is important because it protects the artifacts from oil that might be on your hand, and it also protects you because you're not exactly sure where these things came from and how they uh, might affect your skin. So. Now, what I'm going to show you is an artifact that was found in pieces. So part of the archaeologist's job is to uh, try to figure out what something may have been, where it may have came from, and how it was once used. So you can see that these two pieces were found in two separate places, 
but by carefully looking at them, you can see that they probably were at one time one complete item. Commonly collected items are samples of shell and bone remains. Soil samples can reveal such things as pollen and seeds, which will provide information about the environment at the time the articles were left behind. Shell and bone remains tell us what kind of foods the people ate. Chemical analysis of these bones or charcoal can help date the site. This analysis is called carbon-14 dating. It is very expensive, so the articles chosen for that are carefully chosen before they're submitted. This is a chipped piece of stone knife. Stone artifacts are examined and identified by the kind of stone they are and what they may have been used for. Bone remains can be very interesting. They can tell a lot about an animal, how healthy it was, where it lived. And there's many different kinds of bone represented in this little container. We can see a skull, we can see a piece of vertebrae, we can see parts of a leg bone. This looks like it could have been a shoulder, part of a shoulder or a pelvis bone. So there's many different things and bones can be very interesting indeed. After we've completed examining the articles that we've brought back from the excavation, they're carefully stored. Sometimes they're stored on racks, sometimes they're stored on bags, paper bags, sometimes in plastic bags. Any human remains found are carefully examined to identify age, sex and overall health of the person and any evidence that may indicate how they have died. These remains are then reburied according to the First Nations permits that were obtained before the excavation started. Archaeologists also take the recorded data and create 3D drawings to help them piece together what happened long ago. And a report is written about the excavation results and I hope you have enjoyed our little visit at the lab. Most artifacts are found on archaeological sites, but sometimes artifacts are found by accident, by construction crews, or even people who are digging in their own backyard. So what do you do if you find something like this in your backyard? My first thought would be, wow, this is really cool. I want to keep it and show it to all of my friends. But then I'm going to remember this used to belong to someone and that person's family would probably really like to have it back. So I'm gonna to pretend to be an amateur archeologist. I'm gonna mark where I found it in my yard, how deep down was it, and what kind of soil it was in. Then I'll take all of that information to my local museum and they will help me to figure out where to take it to. Bye. Thanks Bye. For Thanks Bye. for coming. <laughs>